Hello and welcome to the Circular Metabolism Podcast. I'm your host, Aristide from Metabolism of Cities. And in this podcast, we talk with researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to understand what makes urban metabolism and economies more circular. On this uh, episode, I talk with Tomas Diaz. He's the director of the Fab Lab Barcelona, the founder uh, of some projects such as Smart Citizen and Studio P52. He's also one of the brains behind the Fab City. And he has edited the book, Fab City, there we go, uh, the mass production of almost everything. Thomas, thank you for um, accepting this invitation. Um, let's start the, the podcast. Thank you, Aristide. Let me know, um, who are you? How, how do you describe yourself? Well, I am a curious person uh, that uh, is basically not believing everything that people tell me <laughs> and uh, I don't just want to take for granted certain things so out of that curiosity I think I've always been contesting or, or kind of uh, trying to challenge this, the, the way things are uh, and, and one of those I think uh, out of that curiosity I think uh, it has come this uh, I think this honor, I would say, to be part of, uh, of the Fab City Global Initiative and uh, being one of the instigators of it, right? Because somehow it combines uh, part of my life's journey. Um, I was trained as an urbanist uh, in Venezuela. Uh, I, am, I was born and raised in Venezuela. Uh, but I have a mixed background. My father is Spanish, so a lot of connections with Spain during all my life. Um, I out of the, I think, the diaspora of Venezuelans, uh, thanks to the collapse of, the, of our socioeconomic political system uh, during the last, uh, especially 15 years, it's more accelerated, um, I ended up in Barcelona, where I found the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia uh, as the place where I was going to do just an internship of five months. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> many I, years later. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that was 2006, uh, and um, I was supposed to be there for five months. Venezuela was going, you know, in totally worse in all, in, in all the dimensions that you can imagine. But there was this, uh, this day I still remember in which, uh, you know, I have uh, my tutor, Caroline Lichtenberg, a really nice architect from the, from the Netherlands. Um, she was supervising my work. I was editing a book about Taipei. Uh, and then uh, she invited me to this lunch meeting where, you know, um, the, the board of directors were having pizzas. And then she said, oh, we have some extra pizza. Come and sit with us. By that time, there were more directors than employees at IAC. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I think that's why, you know, when there was a discussion about, you know, we have to set up uh, these fab labs and... Uh, we have this pile of, uh, of papers with the inventory. We have this book from this guy called Neil Gershenfeld. Um, but basically, we have a head of studies, a secretary, a maintenance guy, and an intern. So who's going to set up the fab lab? <laughs> <laughs> and then I say, I can do it, you know? Um, then, you know, it was an admitted click. Did you know uh, anything about fab lab before? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Imagine, like I was, this was full discovery and full, like uh, it was revelation after revelation and, and the click between, you know, the, I was immediately, no, I come from this background on, on urbanism, not as, as, as an urban designer on the aesthetics of the city, but we were really doing like a deep studies on the, um, on the socioeconomical dynamics in the city, uh, understanding like uh, the urban economy, the urban ecology and and of course, the way we produce and consume was totally in, is totally entrenched on the way that we live in cities, right? And, uh, and, I, and it was for the first time that I read about someone proposing a different way of, of, you know, approaching the use of technology to transform the way we produce and consume. Um, Neil, uh, you know, his book is called, uh, it's very focused on personal fabrication, no? And he, and I think that's, it's in a way, um, you know, the more American approach, no? like from the yeah. point of the individual, what, the indi what can the individual uh, do, right? Uh, and, but I think there is more, a lot of more collective uh, fabrication than personal 
in the world of, of Fab Labs and in the transformation on, on the way cities, the bio regions, and even the rural spaces uh, uh, produce and consume. No? And I will go back to, to what, I, um, what I think about, the, the, for me, the obsolete difference between the rural and the, and the mm -hmm. urban areas, right? Um, so anyways, like, um, 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 you know, that's a big, a very long answer about who I am, but at well, least giving you a little bit of background on how I, I got to be involved. I mean, I am here because I'm involved in Fab City, no? that's why you invited me. Exactly. Uh, so this is more or less how I get to, to be part of Fab City. There is a lot of things that happen afterwards, but um, I think that uh, I keep it uh, like this for now. So, okay, great. So you were part of this uh, more or less, they, they were somehow interested into this Fab Lab movement and they said, okay, let's put it there. Do, do you know why they were intrigued by, by this or why did they want yeah. to explore this, uh, this question? Well, there is, um, there is for sure, um, you know, a, a direct response to this is that the fact that um, by the time many uh, architecture schools were incorporating uh, digital tools in the in the design and production process, right? Mm. Uh, especially uh, the Architectural Association or the University of Pennsylvania, the SciArc in the West Coast of the U United States were always inspirational um, universities for, for IAC, for IAAC. Um, so of course it was a big component of that. Okay, let's, let's create a lab to provide our students, the, the students that go to do the different masters. Uh, and that by that time, there was just a master in architecture. Let's give them the platform and the, and the, and the tools for them to be at that level of the avant-garde uh, or, or the top schools in the world now, of course, including MIT. Mm -hmm. um, there was also a previous connection with MIT, especially with the Center for Bits and Atoms, uh, thanks to a project that is called the Media House Project and uh, that, uh, was done between uh, our institute and MIT and, and, and the CBA uh, back in the early 2000s, no? like 2000, 2001. Uh, so that's one, uh, was one of the first projects done before the Fab Lab was established. And I think that set up the collaboration um, uh, between, uh, especially Neil and Vicente, right? Um, <clears throat> so I think like that relationship evolved. Uh, and then when the, when the Fab Lab, uh, came to EAC, um, I think that, you know, there was not just the interest of setting up like a workshop with machines for the students, but also, you know, help Neil to develop and, and really put our thinking into under, in, in understanding how these fab labs are going to change, um, you know, neighborhoods or the way that they're going to transform cities. Um, so, um, you know, it was a natural connection. Uh, um, the, the truth is that the agenda of the Fab Lab Barcelona, which I have been lucky to develop, uh, um, has been something that, you know, at the beginning we struggle uh, to, especially in an architecture school that, you know, looks at these tools as a way to, um, you know, provide the students uh, um, and the capacity to create better narratives about speculative approaches sometimes to cities and urban transformation. And it's the process, it, it is, it, it's a, probably it's a process that you can see a lot quicker, some results, no? Like, okay, I do a mock-up of a city mm -hmm. and I see this cocoons type of thing and I put some green and then suddenly you have an image of the future of cities. Like, okay, great, but that's, you know, that kind of a creates this kind of a, I would say dystopian visions, no? It becomes more, more and more dystopic the, the more you use these tools to create more and more and more these topics that seem more and more advanced and i say look at the way we don't have to advance that much we really need to look not to the next 100 years but we need to look to the next minute right yeah and then um the agenda of fab lab uh, you know has been basically looking at that it's like okay yes we have to enable a future um in enabling that future it needs like a first of all patience uh it needs also um invest in learning, uh, invest in, you know, uh, acquiring the skills and the knowledge. Uh, and that's something that not many people is patient enough uh, to see, right? And also it needs a vision as well, which is, you know, I had many times the discussion with some people in the Institute and it's like, you know, at the beginning, of course, the Fab Lab was not generating income by itself, but it was providing a service to the, 
to the programs. Uh, so in a way, it was totally, um, uh, I would say, um, justified the existence of a fab lab. But then in some point, you know, after three, four years, we started to gain projects, uh, professional services, and we started to be interested in research and developing the FAB Academy and gaining students for the FAB Academy. So then suddenly the FAB Lab with that vision on, on that, that slower vision on transforming the city and, and, and starting from the capacity building, uh, it started to gain traction and, and to generate income. Um, so the truth is now, I can say very happily that, uh, you know, the FAB Lab funds the Institute in some way, right? Uh, we, the way we organize ourselves is that we have independent budgets and our budget allow us to have 35 people in the team. When at the beginning it was me with a couple interns and, and you know, um, and I was doing everything like the blog, using the machines, helping the students, taking pictures, uh, receiving politicians. Uh, so um, basically the orchestra man, no? So seeing that happening is like, uh, you know, of course, it's easy to say like uh, um, after the things happened that, okay, yeah. we, we were right, but it's not that we were right. I think like we were just following the intuition. And also we, I think that we were able to identify the opportunities, which is super important. And that's why it somehow led the Fab Lab Barcelona to be, I think like now it's more than a Fab Lab, a lot more than a Fab Lab. I think that's something uh, where I wanted to ask you something. As you describe it, it seems that, you're not just adhering to, let's say, just to DIY with a, with a mechanic toys, right? I mean, it's, yeah. you, you have somehow included a political agenda into it. Totally. I, I don't know if that's the case everywhere. And I don't know, you know, I mean, perhaps how would you describe the Fab Lab uh, or the Fab Lab movement? Your, your personal yeah. point of view, I think. Yeah, I mean... You know, it's, it's, it's difficult to describe it because it's very diverse. So, um, and as you say, there are many fab labs that operate so differently that I think like one of the common things that we have inside the fab lab network is understanding that we are very different from each other, right? There are fab labs inside universities, there are fab labs that are standalone, there are fab labs that are more focused in the technology, there are fab labs that are more focused in the social impact, um, you know, and then of course we have having 2000, around 2000 fab labs around the world, it gives you also, uh, the diversity that gives you the regions, the countries, the, you know, the languages and etc. Right. So it's difficult to say, okay, the fab lab movement is about this, right? No, no, that's um, why I'm asking your, your own interpretation. How, yeah, yeah. what do you use it for? Perhaps so that would be the yeah. more appropriate so, question. Uh, so the, the, the way I see Fab Labs is that they, they play a role that could be compared, uh, maybe not exactly the same, but similar to the role that you know, 25 years ago had places where you would go to use computers, right? Uh, they're providing the access uh, to tools that they are, you know, they're either difficult to operate for some people or they are um, not that affordable or they are just complex or too complex for the way in which we operate now, right? Um, I, I believe that follow-ups are the catalysts to transform the way we produce and consume. So they, ha they, they are these places that in which mainly you learn, you are inspired and you prototype. I don't believe follow-ups are at micro factories or or they will replace industries and so on, or that a fab lab should become a place where people go and just manufacture. I see it more as a cultural places and more yeah. like a, a social connection, uh, which, which is true, but it's also true that they had a strong political agenda. Absolutely. I think that uh, just understanding that the fab city uh, emerged from the fab lab network tells you like uh, how you know, engage, uh, you know, our movement, quote unquote, is with not just playing in the safe spaces inside the walls of a fab lab with the toys, but also committing uh, to go outside and transform uh, neighborhoods, cities, and so on. And we are in the early days. Um, so I think it's different, difficult to judge yet uh, their impact. 
I would say let's wait another five years. And then also there is a, a strong technological agenda or a research mm -hmm. agenda. And I think that here is quite impressive the work and the, and the knowledge that Neil and his group uh, at the C Center for Bits and Atoms uh, brings to the Fab Lab, no? which is understanding that this is not about the machines, but it's actually uh, understanding that we are part of a research that is trying to change how we understand fabrication. We call it digital fabrication today, but the truth is that we have digital information that goes uh, to um, analog machines that can process digital information and they use analog materials to, pro to, to create products in a way. So it's very analog, the process of fabrication at the, uh, uh, as we understand it today. But we're really looking forward is uh, embed you know, the information, the material and the machine in the same place. So it means that instead of you know, um, designing something in a computer, turn that into the movement of a motor and then of, of the actions of a tool that is going to modify the state of a material in the case of 3D printing, or it's going to cut uh, another material in the case of laser cutting or, or computer or CNC machining. Uh, you basically introduce codes into materials and these materials, they just follow the instructions and have the capacity to fabricate themselves, right? <laughs> so this sounds very abstract, but the roadmap is going that direction and it starts from having off the shelf machines that you can buy. And then with these machines, uh, we want to be able to make machines that make machines, right? Um, so the moment that you are able to make your own tools then you are able to make tools that they don't repeat what the previous ones did, but actually they can evolve uh, the capacity of those tools. So imagine having these at the same time that you're having this global collaboration and the capacity and, the, and I think like at the, for me that it's also important is that um, fab labs are located in a context, in a territory. And I think that that's where the, you know, the, the potential of not just waiting until we make the digital assembler, but actually, uh, or the digital materials, but actually we can start to the transition now by connecting the capacity of these fab labs with what's happening around them in neighborhoods. I have to admit for me, it's slightly scary, this, uh machine that builds its own machine and all of that <laughs> it's very skynet to me to be honest but so what i like though is that you, you go from this uh, digital library of the 21st century let's say we don't have books anymore it's more the machine the equipments and then right. you can really think about indeed changing the entire fabrication production and perhaps consumption as well uh, and for me at least the most important interesting thing over there is that uh, well the environmental impact of our word is based on is due to production and consumption activities so there might yeah. be a, an extreme um, benefit by doing so um, of course you, you always think about where is the AI where is the the moral ground who's gonna decide what are the good tools what is the moral judgment into should we do that or that uh, you know where yeah. should we include a human uh, judgment into that or machines will take care of uh, better for us uh, what, what we should do. But that's, I guess uh, these are things that uh, you have thought already many times, but yeah. No, I mean, um, when I talk about machines that bring machines, uh, I'm not thinking about uh, out, you know, an automatic process of this happening. I think that for me, the machine and, the, and the machines and artificial intelligence are just extensions of our capacity, right? Um, and I think that we should keep understanding them like that. The human is a lot, com a lot more complex than just the logic intelligence that you can find in a, in a computer that is able to process ones and zeros. And probably even if you talk about quantum computing with the capacity of handling more complex and larger uh, data sets and make sense out of them, there are some other type of intelligence that the humans have that we will need to keep, keep uh, or take care of, right? Um, you know, we have the brain, but also our guts, yeah. which is part of our, what leads our metabolism, yeah. uh, actually uh, makes part of our intelligence. Even our skin, you know, and all uh, the, the nervous terminations are part of the intelligence that we have, no? So um, 
I think there are multiple intelligences, first of all, and I, I don't think that we should give all uh, our fate and our destiny to one type of intelligence. That That's stupid. And I know that we can be that stupid as doing that, to be honest. Like, I think like uh, humanity, we are really, really testing the limits of a stupidity uh, and and I don't, I, and unfortunately, I think like uh, we are going even, you know, for sci-fi. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think like uh, we will see really stupid things uh, very, very, very soon, and um, uh, more, even more. <laughs> um, but you know, the I think like uh, there should be like an approach in which uh, we understand that our, you know, the, our existence in this planet is not just depending on the products we consume or or having. Uh, the convenience uh, of living with a, you know, uh, at least um, in, the, in which the Western modern society has shown us, right? Like, uh, you know, you have to buy things, you have to own a car, you have to own a property of a house. And, you know, whenever you go outside Europe and, and or you go uh, out, of, uh, out of the, you know, the Western centric views, you see like uh, there are other ways that it's more complex, no? I'm in Bali now. And for instance, you know, property, social organization, uh, even ownership is very complex. It's not as, as rational as, as, as we understand in the West. No? So I think like, uh, we need to accept that there are other ways of organizing uh, society. And it's also another way of relating ourselves with the resources that we consume in order to keep the life on this planet. No? I think that um, we, we yet need to discover alternatives to all the dependency that we have on oil and all yeah. the because it's not just the energy that we generate with oil or or or, or the how we fuel our our mobility infrastructure or mobility devices and uh, you know cars uh, airplanes etc but it's actually you know even the materials uh, embedded in the what we wear how our computers are made uh, what we eat you know this so the salt which is kind of a, like a, most of our salt is made out of oil so it's like it's ridiculous no like we're eating oil um, so I think I like, uh, understanding like, like we need to change the material ecology that's around us is, is, is fundamental. Um, okay. So how do we go then from these labs, which seem to be, you know, here and there into what yeah. you call the fab city then, which is, I guess, because before you said, um, fab labs are not necessarily, you know, micro factories and it's not necessarily the something that you want to change the entire manufacturing system but i guess in fab city you take a much uh, bolder step or stance and you right. and you're you say that you want to transform how cities are there at least their global network of production and consumption are they should change through fab city engagements or um, yeah. yeah promises so basically, like a, what the approach that we're taking is, uh, and it's in the I think it's in the page six of the book, it's a, of the Fab City book. Uh, is uh, I don't know if it's the six. I might be mistaken. It's the full <laughs> stack approach. Um, yeah. So with the full stack, uh, we're trying to unfold this complex mission, which is saying, oh, we're going to transform the way cities produce and consume, and it's going to happen thanks to distributed design and manufacturing an open source collaboration. It's like, uh, okay, but how do you actually, you know, you do it? So, okay, uh, we're working, uh, this is work in progress. So that version that you see in the book is really alpha version of the full stack. But then the full stack aims to be that way in which we unpack the problem into smaller pieces. And also the, the way in which we articulate the research and, and, and also the implementation agenda of FabCity. So um, what we're trying to do is for the 34 cities that are part of the Fab City Network now to have a, a minimum framework for them to identify where they need to invest, where uh, we need to put efforts, what kind of organizations we need to support. And then we put it in, in right now you will see six layers, but we're working on a seventh one. Um, but it comes from, you know, from the infrastructure uh, to new forms of learning, uh, new forms of innovation, the way that this land into the urban environment, how they become into policy, and how they're sharing to platforms with a, you know, a global city network, right? So that's more or less a very simpler uh, description of the, of, the, of the stack. When you talk about the infrastructure, I think that uh, there is something that is needed to be said, like uh, for the last three centuries, more or less, 
uh, most of the investment on infrastructure has gone into the capacity of, uh, of moving atoms, either people or materials, right? Uh, the, the, the global economy we, crea we created, which actually you know, has its roots in the Dutch in West Indies companies, <laughs> established just around the corner here in Indonesia, uh, are following this idea of you know, being able to move materials in which you have a competitive advantage of control over in order to put it in another place of the world, right? Uh, so that, that applies with oil and how dictatorships and totalitarian regimes control uh, oil, or how you know we have Elon Musk accepting that yes, we can make a coup d'état in Bolivia uh, because of course you know it's all for the interest of a company like Tesla to have the control of the lithium. Um, and if you follow, you know, probably Australia is the only country that probably has certain stability where a lot of like a raw materials that we use today uh, are needed in the world. Um, but, you know, without trying to lose um, the line of thought, what I'm saying is that um, when we look at the infrastructure is, is, is you know, airports, ports, big, ve bigger vessels, uh, better airplanes, faster cars, amazing trucks. So we put a lot of intelligence and resources to develop the most advanced technologies around moving things using oil, which is not cheap, by the way. <laughs> we have the sense of cheap oil and cheap raw materials, but they are not cheap. Um, so what we need to think about is like, a, does it make sense really to move that, mo that many materials around the world? Does it make sense to cultivate shrimps in the UK, send them to Thailand to take the peel off and send them back to the UK for you to make your shrimp cocktail uh, at night. So should we, I mean, should, should we go that absurd and stupid or can we just calibrate the way we do these things? Can maybe I, I can invest time on taking the peel off of the shrimp or should I just burn, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, <laughs> fossil fuels just to have the convenience on buying it. So the infrastructure layer is super important. and. Uh, what I'm gonna, uh, what I'm trying, uh, what I'm, what my point is that the fab labs are part of that infrastructure today, right? You're just saying how we go from the fab labs to fab cities. So fab labs are, is an infrastructure that is already in place. So they are like a Trojan horses that are already in, you know, all over the world, but they are not enough at the same time. What we're trying to do is to, you know, influence, convince uh, cities, uh, organizations to allow us to test new forms of production in which the fab lab can serve as an articulator, but at the end we use the, what the city has in place, which most of the times is abandoned factories, which most of the time is underused infrastructure because basically Amazon has been taking over all the, the, all the production of these people, right? So there is an infrastructure in place. So um, what we're trying to do also is articulate that local infrastructure for production that is in place with the creativity or the applications that can come out of places like Fablas, but it could be any, it could be anything, with, anything else, and connect this supply and demand, and understand that at a local level, we need to have that capacity of resilience. And and this was tested with us with, without anyone planning it during the uh, the worst hit, of the, the worst moment of the pandemic, when makers started like at the first response is like okay. I have a 3D printer in my house. I, there is a fab lab in the corner. How we can start to produce masks and distribute it? Everybody starts to do it uh, out of altruism. But then, when the demand started to increase, a lot of fab labs and people were starting to connect with factories, local factories, and the factories were able to take hundreds to thousands, right? And then there is the case of this ventilator in Barcelona, a really nice uh, um, case in which. A factory of cars, they changed their assembly line in order to in even reduce a motor for the cleaners of the, uh, the clean, the, one the, of wipers. The, yeah. the wipers, exactly, uh, uh, and adapted to the motor of the ventilator. And then the, what you see in this case also is that this is still under or, or waiting the approval from the very uh, slow, um, you know, bureaucratic process of getting an invention out in the world. Of course, in this case, it's delicate because we're talking about lives. Now, the corona outbreak is really, it's a political, it's, it's a very politically sensitive uh, subject, but it's showing the, first of all, the needs 
of our, of, for our systems to be more resilient and being able to produce locally, not only products, but also food and energy in the case of a global catastrophe as it's happening, which is compromising supply chains. Um, but also the other side is like, a, we are actually designed for not having the capacity to respond quickly to these yeah. things, right? And then all the economic efforts are, are basically benefiting um, the big capitals and uh, to really move, keep moving materials. This is like, a, and it's disgusting because- uh, Perpetual machine, yeah, exactly. But in a way, like a, this is like a keeping the same extractive model on places that produces the raw materials. So they will, have, they will always be underdeveloped because they never develop a local capacity. And I talk from, I'm being from one of them from Venezuela. It's like, a, let's not develop a local industry because we can sell oil and import everything. What happens when you destroy your oil industry and you cannot buy anything? You blame the United States. That's what the, the Venezuela does. Uh, but then uh, you need to have people working uh, for a lot of hours, 16 hours a day in, in China, 16 hours a day. They live in the factories. And well, actually in China, people are starting to move to Vietnam and, and Cambodia because the Chinese are moving classes, right? And then there is going to start to be a lot of pressure. So China is moving their factories to Southeast Asia, and then they're going to move it to Africa. So it's going to cheap, keep cheap labor perpetually. Uh, then let's try to keep, let's try to make sure like uh, the, the kings of the Middle East keep the oil under control and let's support them so we keep the, the prices down so we can keep moving all these things and just perpetuating this really perverse system of taking advantage of the world's resources. Okay, but yeah. so People. we have, let's say, the open component, right? We, we have the platforms to exchange. We have the Fab Labs. We have now those 37 cities, was it? 34, yes. 34. 34 and maybe will be in October. We have the Fab City Summit, hopefully close to 40 by the end of the Okay, season. so we have 40 cities that commit by 2050, what, what is it? 2054. 2054 to, yeah. to become, uh, what was to it? To produce almost everything that they consume locally right so ideally as we have seen with this external shock this could happen you know in a much shorter time span what is oh no i don't think so i no? think like we are so attached because that entails um no but i mean uh, with shocks yeah. right i mean be it climate change be it resource scarcity be it oh yeah health yeah. issues be it you know a, a lot of uh, a lot of elements which absolutely we're you know, now we're in a pressure cooker. We have all of the external things that are pushing us. We could go much, much faster. What's, what is holding us back, do you think? The... Well, yeah, that's, I think like, that's why I was saying no, no. Like, uh, I don't think that we are ready because I think that we are still too attached uh, to this way of organizing our economy, which is sort of a way of organizing our society. Uh, and what, what really, really connected to it, I mean, and I don't want to be hypocritical, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking, I'm connecting with you from an Apple computer, probably I have coltan from Congo and my aluminum is from, I don't know, from, an, from somewhere in, 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 uh, in Australia and the copper of the battery of my, uh, of the lithium, sorry, of the battery is taken from Bolivia and the copper from Chile, I don't know, right? Yeah. So um, we are part of a paradox in a way. We live in a, in a constant paradox because we are trying to, praise all of this and at the same time we are live deeply inside it, right? Um, I think there is, um, first of all, I think like the, there is no will from any side to transform this. Uh, you know, from the, from the ones, it's, it's a very simple way of organizing a very complex world. And usually the people that wants to be up in power, they don't want complexity. They want to have things very simple, keep yeah. things very simple. And then in the other, in the other end is us, uh, and I include myself on it, uh, uh, which uh, we live trapped in our own convenience, the convenience of having things, you know, to one, a couple of clicks away and I have it delivered to my house. Of course, that's better for me to get dressed, go out, uh, walk or drive uh, to the closest store, talk with a grumpy guy that will 
uh, you know, try to be as unhelpful as possible and then finally get something that I was trying to get. So, of course, you, you buy what you, what you see in the screen and that's more convenient. Uh, so that's basically, it's a double trap. Uh, there's a few of us that understand the paradox. We keep living inside the paradox and it's hard to detach from it, I have to say. And, and it was under the pandemic that, you know, it was epiphany after epiphany moment again. It's like, a, I don't know if it happened to you, but I, I, I can imagine that you have this feeling like, oh God, I thought it was going to be like at, in 10 years, but mm. it's happening now. Mm. Uh, so basically we had like a, we would, you know, sometimes we do this kind of a, a strategic plan of in, think about 10 years. No? Um, and these 10 years now, they are, there are 10 years of that we need to accelerate the process uh, to increase the capacity of, of cities and the regions to be able to provide the citizens and, the, and, and, anyone that lives inside the, those limits, uh, whatever they need. But um, I don't think that's going to happen soon <laughs> at the I, same time. I, I have I to admit, need... yeah, th this uh, pandemic yeah. was really a study for me. I was just looking how things were happened because I was, in my mind, this is how it's going to be very soon. Yeah. All of the time, more or less. We're going to have emergencies left and right and... Uh, uh, one more urgent than the other and we'll have to deal with uh, you know panicking uh, and all of that so i was really trying to to look at all of this and say okay either it might be good that all of the you know hellstorm comes to us so we get done with it once and for all and we get rid with what is happening here but i was yeah. very curious like okay uh, apparently it's feasible to um, to prohibit taking claims. Apparently it's feasible to work all from home, not all social strata, but anyhow, yeah. apparently many norms are not there. So I was, that was really a study element for me. Very, very interesting. We won't yeah, go in. But, yeah, sorry. No, no, no. I, wanna, I wanted to say something, which is, I, I think that knowing that things are not going to change doesn't mean that you don't, you don't, you need to stay still and do nothing. Um, I, what the approach that we're taking though is not trying to wait for everything to change but understand the power of the small interventions of this or the, or the small scale so even the city is too big to think yeah. about making transformation in it so we are trying to reduce the scale of intervention to you know villages uh, or like a sub villages inside the cities or neighborhoods when we're talking about less than 10,000 people where you can articulate communities and start to you know, test experiment um, with new forms of producing energy, new forms of distributing energy, or uh, also with food and, and, and just hacking, for instance, the material flows at that scale. So that's the approach that we're taking. And also I wanted to mention that you know, going back uh, to the discussion I was saying before about the stack, no, and okay, from infrastructure to learning to innovation and to uh, urban strategies, uh, those are really fast, right? Like the fast, fast layers of the stack. Yeah. Um, the slow ones are the policy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? But you know, since we have already infrastructure in place like Fab Labs and also underused or, you know, or almost dead infrastructure in cities. Um, we can reactivate those and it's kind of relatively quick, but I think like, uh, we need also to invest a lot into learning, into new forms of learning. And I, meaning that, you know, this is, it is possible to articulate all the layers of the educational systems, like, uh, you know, from high school to universities to PhDs, if you put them all together under a common mission, right? Uh, of really trying to resolve the trap in which we are getting towards, which is we are putting in risk our own, uh, our own existence and also the existence of life in this planet. I am sure that we have that capacity. So uh, I believe that, that we need to keep influencing and that's something that we should not stop. And I guess that that's the work that you guys are doing as well is yeah. 
making noise and making this very visible and show how idiotic we are as much as we can. That's a great segue to the two final questions I had for you. What are you going to do this next year or what should we focus on this next year? You mentioned education. And the last one was, what are the books, videos, articles, films that you would uh, recommend to anyone to start right now? Um, or music yeah, me, or, yeah. Yeah, well, let me start from the last one. Uh, there's a nice documentary in Netflix that is called Banda. B-A-N-D-A is about the Banda Islands in Indonesia. And I think that explains a lot the roots of uh, capitalism and in global, in, in globalization. I, I highly recommend it because basically um, the market of the nutmeg and clove uh, and the conquer of the West Indies, uh, oh, the East Indies, sorry, uh, led to the discovery of America, first of all, <laughs> by accident. Uh, well, the discovery by Europe, uh, especially. Uh, and also it was the established the foundations of a current uh, global extractive colonialist uh, capitalistic system. And again, I'm not saying it this as, a, as someone that needs to pretend that it's not capitalist. Uh, I'm part of the system. Eh? Uh, I'm not trying to be hypocritical here. Uh, I recommend an article, which for me is super key, is the, the tyranny of convenience. It's a New York Times article. It's, okay. Have you read it? No. Oh, it's pure gold. Okay, I'm noting this down. Thanks. Pure gold, definitely. Um, I think also, you know, of course, and this is, you know, it sounds like an Oprah Winfrey <laughs> recommendation. It's all mainstream, but Yuval Noah Harari uh, is probably one of the most interesting historian philosophers that is um, that is explaining us where we come from in a, in a different pers with a different perspective and where we might go and which are the things that we need to be aware of. And not only, you know, he talks a lot about AI, but you were right. Uh, it's scary also to think about when AI is also able to manipulate the physical world with machines that are ruled by AI. So mm -hmm. definitely you all know Harari. And someone that I really enjoy with his tweets, for instance, is Jason Hickel. Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> wow, it's so refreshing. Uh, I'm not. I'm. I'm not tired of of retweeting him. And then, yeah, people like Indy Johar as well, uh, Kate Raworth, people that you know we need to look closer, follow, and support as well. You know, and understand that the way we support them uh, is also a way to to introduce a new way of thinking about our economy and about the world. Um. Yeah, I have a lot more things, but uh, yeah, read uh, for the. Non-Latin Americans, uh, I think it's beautiful to read Gabriel Garcia Marquez, a yeah. psychological writer. So yeah. that's out of the topic, but I think that- I love, way, I love the fantasy of it, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, and also I think that's uh, one of the challenges we have right now, probably it's not that much technical. I think it's also cultural. Uh, and I think that cultural diversity in the world and then understanding that uh, that's actually what makes us rich uh, it's really important to keep now because in the context, in the current context of polarization, uh, we are at the risk of having this, uh, again, to keep living under this imposed, um, no, want colonialist way of, uh, of distributing the world. I'm sorry. I'm, and, and I can say this because I am a, a, a colonizer and I'm a, I am a colo and I colonized am colonized. And colonized yeah. Exactly. So I am allowed. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, and then finally, uh, your question about the next year, I like it, you know, because as I was telling you before, so many people know what to do in 2030 and 2050 and so on, uh, but it's really difficult to think about the next year. And, um, um, you know, I'm putting a lot of my energy in, uh, in, in, in creating a, a learning environments, I call it, I want to create. I think like we need to create learning environments rather than create more uh, pre-established programs, uh, theories, or follow the, we need to really transform a little bit the, the scientific method and then uh, understand that it's not about us uh, developing a theory and trying to prove that theory in an experiment. And, and that can be also taken to the city scale. And sometimes it's very dramatic when that happens because it affects a lot of people. It's not the same as doing an experiment in the laboratory. But uh, creating learning environments in which we can 
you know, challenge almost everything is super important. Uh, and, you know, um, I direct a master uh, that is now based in Barcelona. It's the Master in Design for Emerging Futures. Uh, but I'm going to work in the next year on trying to make it distributed around the world and, and allow people to, to be part of it uh, without having to go to Barcelona necessarily. Similar to how we do with the FAB Academy. And, and, and if you, you know, going back to the stack, this is, will be the second layer after the infrastructure. So um, that's the other part that we're gonna do next year as well uh, inside FAB City. Uh, the FAB City Global Initiative is to go deeper into the stack and, uh, and make it more understandable and useful and, and, and um, as, much, as comprehensible as possible. And then finally, um, this next year is gonna be uh, the year of, of uh, infrastructuring or, or kind of a giving a minimum structure to the Fab City Foundation, which is one of the three components of the whole Fab City Global Initiative. It's the Fab City Foundation giving the organizational support and, and providing some funding sources. The Fab City Network is the second one, which is the 34 cities, hopefully 40 by the end of the year that are somehow supporting actively and some passively, to be honest, but at least that uh, we managed to convince to join this crazy idea. And then the Fab City Collective, which is uh, around 100 uh, individuals that as you know, we were talking before we started recording, they are still in time from their, from their organizations uh, to work on, uh, on supporting the Fab City in many ways. So that's next I'm year. <laughs> I'm very, very much looking forward then for the next year. Thanks so much, Thomas, uh, for your time. And yeah, we'll, let's find uh, things to collaborate on and uh, let's get uh, things moving. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you so much, Aristide. And thanks uh, to Metabolism of Cities for inviting me to this. Thank you. Great.